Next on the food hospital, we're taking on the taboo, lifting the lid on the embarrassing conditions that many of us are too ashamed to talk about. From a man who's hoping diet can help to conquer his embarrassing erection problem. In your case, these arteries are blocked, and so blood can't flow enough into the penis to get an erection. To a woman desperate for relief from her chronic burning cystitis. Some men tend to think it's a sexually transmitted infection, which it isn't. And a young lawyer with a fairly common but shockingly unreported skin disease. I'm very self-conscious about the smell and the appearance of infection coming out from underneath the shirt. And can chilli really be the latest weapon in the fight against flab? Gee, you feeling that now? <laughs> My mouth is burning. The first person to come to the food hospital is a young human rights lawyer who's been living with a surprisingly common but rarely discussed incurable skin disease. My name's Gerzen, I'm 25 years old. I'm from North London and I have hydrogenitis suppurativa. Hydrogenitis suppurativa is a chronic inflammatory disease which affects at least one in every hundred people in the UK. Those who have it are often too embarrassed by the distressing symptoms to seek help, so the exact figure is unknown. But Gozen's case is at the severe end of the scale, and as no conventional medicine has improved her condition, she's come to see the food hospital GP Gio Meletto. OK, Gozen, can we take a look at your uh, rashes and where it is? Let's have a look. I'll give you a hand here. You're moving quite cautiously. Yeah. So that's because it's painful. It is very painful. Yeah. So let's have a look at this armpit here. So I'm taking off these little gauze pads, and you can see there's pus on there from the cysts. So I mean, if we look at the skin here, um, are you okay holding your arm like that for a second? Yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, basically, there's lots of different features here that's typical of hydrogenitis. So you've got these kind of pussy sort of um, lumps here that are oozing actively, and they're bleeding as well. And you can see there's holes in the skin. And if we feel around very gently, there's these sort of pea-sized lumps so there's sort of blackheads and kind of pustules and these little lumps you can feel in the skin as well. And again, you get these really sort of juicy kind of pustules really. And some of these are breaking down on their own. A little bit infected, that one. That's, did they get infected quite a lot? They definitely ooze throughout the day. I yeah. could just be sitting down and having a discussion with someone or over dinner and then start leaking. feel a leak coming down my neck, which is so uncomfortable. Yeah. There's a lack of significant research into this hidden disease. One reason is because it's so underreported. Doctors don't yet know what causes it, but believe it may be linked to the immune system. It is known that the apocrine sweat glands found in areas like the back, armpits, chest and groin get blocked and form cysts which ooze discharge. The affected areas are extremely painful. It's all gushing out. Everywhere's inflamed. If I suppress that, it'll come out more. I've got some scarring here. I've had an operation before where they've drained it. Gozen manages her condition with a lengthy routine of washing and dressing with creams and bandages. This enables her to hide her embarrassing symptoms from the world. Especially when going to work, I can't have the infection dripping all over my top. It's not professional. And um, I'm very self-conscious about the smell um, and the appearance of infection coming out from underneath the shirt. As I said, it's not professional and it's, it's not something I want people to know either. However much they're concealed, for Gozen, her symptoms are always painfully present, but she does her best to get on with life. In fact, she and her boyfriend, Ursin, are soon going backpacking around South America. But Gozen is worried their adventure will be ruined if her persistent symptoms don't improve. I'm going to have to carry a big backpack on my back and both my underarms are quite affected. But if I could just somehow stop the discharge and the pain from the swelling, that would be absolutely amazing. So this blood test here is your CRP, C-reactive protein, something that gets raised when there's inflammation in the body. Normally, you know, in somebody who doesn't have any inflammation, you'd expect to see it under 5. Yours is 72. Wow. Right? So that's all that sort of pus and sort of inflammatory process going on. There is no 
strong evidence really that we can treat hydradenitis sparativa with diet. However, there are some dietary changes that can help lower inflammation in the body. Now whether that will have a knock-on effect and help your hydradenitis, we don't know. When we eat foods that raise our blood glucose quickly, insulin is released and high levels of insulin have been linked to inflammation in the body. So Gozen needs to eat a diet based on whole grain foods, pulses, fish, fruit and veg. These foods release lower levels of glucose into the bloodstream, which means less insulin is released. Foods to be avoided are those high in sugar or refined carbohydrates, such as sweets, cakes, white bread, rice, pasta and sugary drinks. As seen on the Food Hospital recently, this diet can help acne, as well as lowering the risk of heart disease, obesity and cancers. But its effects on hydrogenitis suprativa are unknown. It's really quite experimental. Sounds good. You're willing to give it a go? Definitely. And I think it will improve your overall health anyway. Sounds great, thank you. I've tried practically every single type of drug that they can give me to try and limit it, and nothing's worked. So if food can help control it in some way, then I'm quite optimistic about it. I'm Dr. Pixie McKenna. Throughout this series, I'll be tracking down the real heroes of the food world. From a performance-enhancing root to a potential cancer-fighting spice. This week, I'm looking at the latest tool in the fight against flab. We're constantly being bombarded by new slimming products coming onto the market, but often it's just our wallets that are getting thinner. But some scientists have become very excited about the potential flab-busting qualities of one food. And that's the chilli. The diet industry is worth £2 billion a year in the UK and us women can spend up to £25,000 on weight loss products during our lives. So the news that there could be a cheap, fiery flab buster sitting in the fruit and veg aisle is seriously exciting. So I've come to the physiology department of Chichester University to meet PhD student Stephen Whiting, who's all fired up about chilli. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi there, how are you doing? Pixie. I'm Stephen, nice to meet you. Likewise. Now, what's happening here? This looks very scientific. What we're investigating today, we're interested in whether um, consuming chilies can help people lose weight. So what's the magic in the chilli that, that potentially makes it a fat buster? OK, so there's a, a spicy chemical uh, which is called capsaicin. So this is what stimulates the the spicy taste in your mouth, that, that kind of sensation. Burning. Get, the burning sensation. What Ross is doing at the moment is uh, he's having his kind of his breathing rate measured. So this will help us measure how many calories he's burning off, basically. So we're monitoring his resting rate now. Uh, then we're going to give him a spicy curry and we're going to perform the same experiments again and see if there's any, any difference in how much energy he's burning off. Would you like to have a go? As long as I don't get the really spicy you curry. Sure? Do you enjoy eating spicy curries? I, I'm not too spicy. But a uh, medium spice would be all right. But yeah, listen, it's going to make me lose a few pounds. I'm, I'm up for it. Dr. Steve Myers is the physiologist who's helping Stephen. He measures everyone's basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of energy we need for our vital organs to work while at rest. Everyone's basal metabolic rate is different, as it depends on things like your size, age, gender, muscle mass and fitness. The scary looking mask measures how much oxygen we consume and how much carbon dioxide we breathe out. The computer then uses these figures to calculate how much energy we burn at rest. I'm usually more of a korma girl than a vindaloo, but in the name of science, I'll give it a go. Let's get eating, I think. To see if chilli really is a flab buster, we're all going to eat curries containing different amounts of bird's eye chilli, apart from Faye, who's the chilli free control. Ross is mild at one chilli. I'm more wild with two, and foolish Stephen is eating a fiery three chilies. Will we burn more calories and make our metabolic rates go sky high? The heat is on. That's spicy. I see I would consider that really, really spicy. Cheapest. <laughs> You're feeling that now? I'm really feeling it, yeah. That capsaicin is definitely getting me all hot and bothered. Come on, you can do it. It's burning. My mouth is burning. I kind of feel a bit teary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? Just because you've only had one. <laughs> I 
so chilli certainly makes my mouth burn. But I'm dying to see if it burns my fat too. We'll find out the results later. Next into the food hospital is a 73-year-old former engineer from Hampshire who is looking to get help with an embarrassing problem that affects half of men over 40 at some time or another. My name is Terry Gagarin Rawlins and I suffer with erectile dysfunction. Terry isn't the only pensioner to want a healthy sex life. Sexual activity in the elderly might be one of the last taboos, but in fact 70% of people over 70 are still having sex. I get an adequate erection, but not enough for penetration. Terry fell madly in love with his wife Svita six years ago, which was a bolt from the blue as he'd resigned himself to spending the rest of his life alone. They're very much in love, but there's one important thing missing, which is affecting both partners. It would be really fantastic. If Terry can sort out his erectile dysfunction, I think that uh, it actually can bring uh, bright colours into our intimate relationship and uh, be just, I think, a miracle. There are a number of causes of erectile dysfunction. In younger men, it is likely to be anxiety or stress-related, but in middle-aged or older men, it is often a result of a problem with the cardiovascular system, as it is in Terry's case. I suffer with peripheral vascular disease, and that cause, causes loss of blood pressure in the bottom half of my body. Peripheral vascular disease, or PVD, is a condition where fatty deposits narrow the arteries, restricting blood flow. Symptoms include pain in the calves during activity, numbness in the legs, and shiny, discoloured skin. People with the disease are four to five times more likely to have a heart attack or stroke. Currently, Terry manages his PVD with daily aspirin and statins to help thin his blood and lower his cholesterol, but his symptoms remain. Terry's love for Svita has given him the motivation to try to improve his erectile dysfunction and his health. I really can't emphasise what it's meant to me to find this lady in the latter part of my life. I love her so very much, and so my fear of growing old and dying too soon is a real one for me, and I want to extend my life as long as possible. So he's come to see the food hospital's GP, Dr Gio Mileto. There's a part of the penis called the corpus uh, cavernosum, which in Latin sort of means the cavernous body, and that fills up with blood yeah. in order to expand the penis to get an erection if things are working normally. And here you can see the two uh, major arteries that supply the corpus cavernosum. In your case, these arteries are blocked, and so blood can't flow enough into the penis to get an erection. Factors that contribute to vascular disease are having high blood pressure, yeah. um, being diabetic, a family history of heart disease, uh, smoking, mm -hmm. and having high cholesterol. Now, I'm actually getting a bit of a waft of uh, cigarette uh, smoke. So, uh, you're a smoker, are you? Yes. Okay, that you know, is a massive key factor in causing the vascular disease that you've got. Uh, and that includes the poor blood supply to the penis. Mm. Tobacco kills up to half its users, and smoking is the biggest cause of PVD. It stimulates the formation of a fatty substance called atheroma, which narrows the arteries. Chemicals in the cigarettes also deprive tissues of oxygen and make the blood more likely to clot. The blood vessels of the penis are you know, a few millimetres in diameter. Yeah. The ones supplying the heart aren't much larger. Yeah. So if you've got a blockage there, you're going to get a blockage in all other places as well. Yeah. But it's highly likely it's affected your kidneys, your eyes, or the heart, possibly even the arteries that supply the brain. Mm. So what we're talking about here is your overall cardiovascular health. Yep. Okay. The first thing Terry needs to do is stop smoking, but if he can combine a cigarette-free life with a cardio-improving diet, over time he could change his erectile dysfunction and life expectancy for the better. Dietitian Lucy Jones wants to give Terry a practical hands-on guide to his new heart-healthy food plan, which is based on the Mediterranean diet. There's a rule of thumb here. The diet that's going to be best for your heart mm -hmm. is also the diet that's going to be best for your penis. That's interesting. 
<laughs> and it's all to do with the blood vessels. Yeah. So the Mediterranean diet is actually what we're going to prescribe for you. Yeah. It specifically helps the function of the inner wall of the blood vessels and yeah. it also helps circulation, which of course is the problem yeah. in both the peripheral vascular disease and the erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Research has also linked the Mediterranean diet with reduced incidence of cancer mortality, as well as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. Normally, Terry tends to gorge on one gigantic dinner a day, but regularly eating more diverse, smaller meals could really improve his condition. One of the first components of the Mediterranean diet is having a really good variety of fruits and vegetables. No one particular vegetable is better than another. It's more about getting a really good variety, lots of different colours, lots of different textures, every day, and making it quite a big percentage of what you're eating in a day. Yeah. Terry should eat beans, pulses, whole grain pasta and bread, nuts and seeds. He'll also have to limit his saturated fats. But there's one food with powerful properties that Lucy wants him to put into his diet. So, the next thing is the secret ingredient. Oh, wicked. <laughs> it's actually these. Pistachio nuts. Oh, gosh. Pistachios contain the amino acid arginine, which helps to relax and dilate the blood vessels. Research has shown it can increase blood flow to the penis by up to 22%. That sounds all right. In fact, I'll buy a packet of that and take it out as well and eat them on the way home. Good plan. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a long road to walk with Terry. He's come to us at a real starting point, having one meal a day, smoking, not keeping himself physically active. There are so many things that we need to tackle. I'm feeling pretty good and positive about starting, but uh, the smoking will probably be a slow job. Some of us women spend a shocking 10 years of our lives on a diet, but the potential flab-fighting ability of the simple chili is currently getting scientists, and me, excited. To find out if it's a worthy food hero, I'm taking part in an experiment at the University of Chichester. Myself and the other human guinea pigs have all eaten curries containing different amounts of chilli, while our metabolic rates have been closely monitored to see if the capsaicin chemical has had an effect. An hour after eating the chilies, it's results time. Faye had the chilli-free control curry and saw no rise in her metabolic rate. But the burning question for those of us who had the chilies, was it worth the pain? So Steve, we're all lined up in our order of chilliness. How did we do? How did we fare in the experiment? Right, in order of chilliness, Ross, you had a 3% increase. Pixie's yours increased by 14% and Steve increased by 8%. Ah, so one woman, two chilies is the winner. Yes, it is. Yes. Our metabolic rates all increased as shown in dark blue, which is great news for weight loss as it means that chilies have helped us burn more calories. But how does it work? It's believed there are three ways this capsaicin can help you shift weight. Firstly, the burning sensation in the mouth triggers the release of adrenaline and raises the core temperature of the body. This increases the heart and breathing rate, meaning that we use up more calories. Capsaicin also increases fat oxidation, pushing the body to use more fat as fuel. Good news for the waistline. And finally, this clever chemical also suppresses the appetite, though it's not yet fully understood how. You had three chilies. I did have three chilies. Thankfully, I only had two, but I beat you. Mine went up 14%. Yeah. Why is that? Well, uh, human beings vary, do you know what I mean, from person to person, yeah. so the results aren't always that consistent. Um, also, I eat quite a lot of chilies anyway. I'm quite right. a regular chilli consumer. I think you're not, are you? So... Not really a massive fan. So that may be a, an influence on it as well. Research suggests that you can burn up to 50 extra calories a day if you regularly eat chilli. More long-term research needs to be done, but this could give significant weight loss over one to two years. I might even add some to my diet. But be warned, some curries can be really calorific, so my top tip is to use chilli as a spicy addition to a healthy, balanced meal. You could have spicy jerk chicken and rice, serve flatbread chips with a spicy salsa, or even spice up a simple meal like spaghetti bolognese. 
The health benefits of a daily dose of chili don't just stop at its fat burning ability. It's also packed full of vitamin A and C and has been found to be a powerful painkiller. I think chili is a real food hero. Another hero of the food world is fibre. And at the Food Hospital, we've launched a challenge to the people of the UK to add more fibre to your diets and monitor the effect on your stools. It's all in a bid to lower the risk of bowel cancer, the UK's second biggest cancer killer. Over 50,000 people have already downloaded the app. We've also asked 50 volunteers to add extra fibre to their normal diets and record any changes in their bowel movements and health. 55-year-old Deborah was keen to do the challenge because her age means she is more at risk of developing bowel cancer. Any previous reluctance to discuss poo has disappeared and she is now a convert to the cause. It's always been sort of a taboo subject, but since I started this challenge, um, I haven't been too shy when it comes to talking about bowel movements and toilet habits. And I'm a little embarrassed to say that I've been in a few restaurants and I've just sort of blurted out to my friends, have you had a poo today? Or have you had a bowel movement? I think they're all getting a little fed up with me. Deborah has been charting her poo progress with the Fibre Challenge smartphone app. This Fibre Challenge app is really good fun. I really like doing it. It asks some important questions in the beginning about what types of foods you eat. And then of course, then we get into how much fibre uh, intake you, you've had every day, and then we get into what stool type. I've certainly experienced type 1, um, which is separate hard lumps like nuts, they're hard to pass. And that's sometimes if I'm constipated and um, probably haven't had enough fiber in my food. So I didn't have any of that while I was on the challenge, I'm pleased to say. And um, hopefully I won't have that again if I keep my fiber intake up. Three weeks ago, Terry came to the food hospital with erectile dysfunction caused by a circulation problem, peripheral vascular disease. Hello. For a couple head over heels in love, Terry's inability to get an erection is limiting their physical relationship. To help get Terry in rude health, Lucy has recommended a long-term Mediterranean diet. So today, it is cod fillets. She wants him to eat lots of vegetables, whole grains, fish, lean meat, and a daily dose of pistachio nuts to help improve his blood flow. I'm enjoying what the uh, food hospital are recommending because it's actually engaged my mind into finding out more about how I should eat, what I should eat, and the advantages of eating these things. And the, the future is looking bright because I've lost some weight and it's going really quite well. I think that's why I love him so much, <laughs> because he <laughs> feeds me. <laughs> I think Mediterranean diet is very good for, for anybody, particularly for Terry, because he, um, he's feeling more, more energetic, I think. So he's embracing the new diet, but despite Gio's warning, Terry is still indulging in his worst vice. And however many pistachios he guzzles while doing it, smoking is still a major cause of his cardiovascular problem. I haven't really given up it yet. Um, I'm just sort of preparing myself. But uh, in spite of what all the statistics say, I've never really had any problems. I've never had a, a thought for my health. Whenever I've given up smoking, I've given it up a few times in the past. It's always been a financial thing. And then I met Svita, and of course, now I don't really want to die early. But um, I've got another 15 cartons to go through. So I was thinking really about New Year. Giving up the cigarettes is the hardest part of Terry's lifestyle change. So will his love for his wife win over his love of cigarettes? The next patient at the food hospital is tormented by one of the most common and embarrassing illnesses that affect women. My name is Rachel Marie, I'm 31 years old, I'm from Birmingham, 
and I've suffered for a long time with urinary tract infections. Cystitis is one type of urinary tract infection, or UTI. These agonisingly painful infections affect an astounding 50% of women at some point in their lives. It's painful, it burns a lot, um, and also you feel like you need to go to the toilet all the time, it's really uncomfortable. I do think men probably still are a bit funny about it, you know, it's down there, it's not something that they want to know about. Bladder infection is a really awful thing to experience, um, it's really uncomfortable and can actually make you quite ill, um, so anything that prevents it or can help um, get rid of it is really, really good to know about. 20% of young women who have their first UTI will have a recurring infection, but Rachel's been plagued by cystitis almost constantly for over 10 years. I get UTIs on a very frequent basis. You don't know when it's going to occur, you have no control over it, and it can be very painful. A UTI is usually caused by bacteria from the gut entering the urinary tract after passing through the rectum. The microbes travel up the urethra, which carries the urine outside the body. They can then stick to the walls and infect the urinary tract or the bladder, which is known as cystitis. In the most severe cases, it can move up and can cause a kidney infection. Some men tend to think it's a sexually transmitted infection, which it isn't. Rachel has been hospitalised six times in five years, so finding a cure has become an obsession. To stop her infections, she's tried drinking cranberry juice as well as a number of other approaches. But Rachel has seen no improvement, so she's come to the food hospital to meet dietitian Lucy Jones and consultant surgeon Shaw Summers. So you get recurrent urinary tract infections. Yes. How do you know they're coming on? I can feel it straight away um, with a burning sensation, feeling of needing to go to the loo more often and pain radiating up towards my kidneys. Bugs in the urinary stream are pretty frequent, especially in women. We've got a sample of your urine that we've put on the microscope here. And you see these patches here, those are what we call epithelial cells. Mm. They're the lining cells of your bladder, which are normally shed off. Okay. But in between that, you see these little dots that are moving around and mm -hmm. these little lines that are moving. They're bugs in the urine. It's when those bacteria get into the wall of the bladder you get cystitis and that's when you start getting the discomfort, the pain. The fact is you're needing antibiotics quite frequently. Eventually you will get bugs that are resistant. We need to work quite hard trying to minimise the chances of you getting a urinary tract infection in the first place and that needs prevention. I'm almost constantly ill and I would just love to have a break from it. Even just for a few months, it would be great. It would be like having a holiday. Rachel is not alone. In the UK, there are around 10 million GP visits about UTIs every year, so it's familiar territory for Gio Mileto. Urinary tract infections are common infections that typically affect women more than men, that's because the anatomy of the body. It can be very painful and sometimes very embarrassing as well. Things you can do to try and prevent them would be to drink plenty of water, pass urine after you've had sex, and also wipe yourself from front to back. And the reason for that is to try and avoid spreading bacteria that can cause the UTI into that area. To get her UTI prevention plan, Rachel's seeing dietitian Lucy Jones, who has some news about the common advice to treat UTIs with cranberry juice. We can't treat a UTI with food. I think there's a, a lot of young ladies that end up with cystitis and go and drink loads of cranberry juice thinking yeah. it gets rid of it, where in fact, Cranberries is one of the methods that we're going to employ today, but it only works as a preventative measure. Mm -hmm. The active compound is a phytonutrient called flavanols. And what they do is they stop certain bacteria from sticking to the cell walls. And that works in your gut, but it also works in your bladder and your urethra, so it can stop the bacteria adhering to the cell walls and therefore prevent you from developing as many UTIs. What we're going to do is get you to have about 150 mils of cranberry juice, which is a small glass, and two handfuls of dried cranberries per day. Okay. Cranberry juice is often sweetened to make it more palatable. However, if that's a concern, varieties are available with no added sugar. Another thing we'd like to try you on is fermented milk products, things like probiotic yoghurts. Mm -hmm. Emerging evidence is showing yeah. that people that take probiotics or yoghurts tend to have lower incidences of UTIs. 
Lucy also prescribes a nutritious diet of fruit, vegetables, whole grains and oily fish, which should help keep Rachel in optimum health. This food plan would be of benefit to anyone wanting to fight infection. I'm willing to try anything now. It's got to the point where anything is better than this and a natural remedy really appeals to me. Twenty-five-year-old Gozen came to the food hospital seeking help for her excruciating hydrogenitis suppurativa. She was given an insulin-regulating diet to try and help control the inflammation in her body. Though she's travelling around South America, Gozen is keen to keep the food hospital experts updated. I'm at the Salt Flats in Bolivia, this beautiful place, enjoying ourselves, having a great time. It's a second country. Um, in terms of my condition, it's still quite difficult carrying a bag. Um, it's been a bit painful, but I'm not letting it get in my way. I'm still keeping up. I've run out of bandages now, so it just has to dry up. It's going really well, but in terms of the diet, I'm trying to stick to it as best as I can. Um, it's a bit difficult because they like meals that consist of carbs, carbs, and then more carbs. That's pretty cool. Hi guys! Hi. Usually going over speed bumps is a slight problem in the UK because of the bumpiness in my chest. I'm usually like, ow, ow, ow. I'm galloping on a horse right now. And it doesn't hurt. But Will Gozen's new diet and sunny adventures have had as dramatic an effect on the look of her skin when she returns to the food hospital. This series, The Food Hospital, is clearing up confusion about our health and the food we eat. Today, I'm looking at the conflicting headlines about water. For years, we've been told to drink up to eight glasses of water a day to keep ourselves healthy and hydrated. And we take this advice to heart by spending £1.5 billion a year on bottled water. But recent reports have suggested that this advice is actually a myth. So I want to find out how much water we need to drink every day and how much is too much. Our bodies are made up of a whopping 50 to 60% water. And as a doctor, I know just how essential it is. It carries the nutrients and waste products around the body, regulates our temperature and is a building material for our cells, a lubricant and a shock absorber. So to maintain this volume of water, we obviously have to keep topped up. But how much do we need? To find out more, I'm meeting Bridget Benelum, a nutrition scientist who is overflowing with hydration information. She's got a really high-tech model to show how the body deals with water. Now just imagine the pipe is my body. So looking at my pipe here, it's pretty representative of optimum hydration. It's not overflowing, yeah. it's not empty. It's pretty, it's pretty good, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. If we start, you know, putting more and more fluid in my body, gets rid of the water, doesn't it? Yes. We are constantly losing water through breath, sweat, urine and feces. Your body has no way of storing water. So once you've reached the optimal level of hydration, your body just excretes any excess and then you come back to your optimal level of hydration again. But your kidneys have got a limit to how much water that they can get rid of at any one time. So if you exceed that amount of water, the water stays in your body and essentially makes all your bodily fluids too dilute, which is not good for the overall balance of the body. So we can be too wet? We can be. It's easy to keep track of your water intake from drinks, but I'm definitely not aware of how much water is in food. And Bridget has a surprise for me. 
This is all your food from yesterday, and altogether it's about 500 mils of water, so nearly a pint of water just from your food. Oh, really? So it's kind of surprising, isn't it, when you look at it? I mean, I would have just assumed maybe a potato, because it looks watery, yes. would have water yeah. in it, but certainly not a, a steak. Actually, a steak is probably in the region of sort of 60-70% water. What about people who drink water as a form of detox? Yeah, that's a really common idea that you can drink loads of water and it'll sort of flush your system out, flush all the toxins out and make you clean again. Um, your body has very specialist ways of getting rid of toxins. Your liver does that and your kidneys too. But there's no evidence that having loads and loads of extra water makes that process work any better. So there's no real get benefit to be had from having loads and loads of extra water. All you'll do really is go to the toilet more. So who's made up the eight glasses of water myth? Well, as far as I know, it came from the States originally and then was adopted over here. Now, that's a very general recommendation. Um, a lot of people take that as it must be six to eight glasses of just plain water and that must be on top of all your other fluids. So that's not really the case because you can get fluid from all your drinks, apart from stronger alcoholic drinks. So it's a myth that we need to drink eight glasses of water every day. But although any non-alcoholic liquid will hydrate you, water is obviously the lowest calorie option. We need to keep ourselves adequately hydrated so our body functions well. Most of us are probably doing this anyway without giving it a second thought. But when it comes to advice about how much water we should drink, we should listen to our own body and nobody else. And always remember, if you feel thirsty, water from the tap is totally free. Three weeks ago, Rachel came to the food hospital desperate for a solution to the recurrent UTIs which were plaguing her with embarrassing and painful symptoms almost every day. Back home in Birmingham, she's been following Lucy's preventative prescription for pain-free pee. I'm sticking to my diet. I'm getting there slowly. I'm implementing a lot of the things I was um, told at the food hospital and trying to incorporate them into my diet. Lucy recommended Rachel has probiotic yoghurt and cranberry juice every day. Cranberries contain flavanols, which can prevent bacteria from adhering to the walls of the urinary tract and causing an infection. So for the millions of women who've experienced the torment of a UTI, have these simple steps helped Rachel at all? I'm not getting the burning sensation. I'm also not getting that heavy feeling. And I don't know whether it's psychological because I've started this diet, but I don't seem to be needing the loo as often and I don't feel bursting and I don't wake up in the night needing to go, so I have been feeling a lot better lately. Rachel's partner Hitesh has also seen a significant change. I think the diet's working. She seems a lot healthier and happier in herself. She seems to have lost a little bit of weight as well. It's been very uh, a very sort of positive uh, outcome. Uh, we've just got to keep up the hard work now and keep working at it and uh, look to the future, basically. I'm just really glad that I haven't had a recurrence of the infection so far, so luckily I've been feeling great. Ten weeks later, the results are impressive. Rachel has been UTI-free since she started her diet. That's the longest period she's gone without infection for five agonising years. If this progress continues, she'll be able to enjoy her life and family once more. Coming up, has Gozen been able to follow her experimental diet while travelling in order to improve her distressing skin condition? So, uh, Gozen, can we take a look at your skin? And has lovebird Terry been able to swap his cigarettes for a sexier life? Six weeks ago, 73-year-old smoker Terry was prescribed a Mediterranean food plan with extra pistachio nuts to improve his cardio health and erections. But has he managed to change his diet, kick the cigarettes and get an erection? So Terry, how's it all been going? Brilliantly, really. I was so taken with the idea of what's going on here, the philosophy behind it, and um, I managed to lose about three quarters of a stone in the first three weeks. Wow. So I was very happy about that. Terry, you came here because you had erectile dysfunction as a result of your peripheral vascular disease. Mm. How are the erections? No change, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I wouldn't expect too much of this. Yeah. 
that's because it's going to be months before it really makes a change. Years, really. Years, yeah. You know, in the evidence that's been done to date, and there is evidence to support mm. a Mediterranean-style eating yeah. pattern in erectile dysfunction, but it tends to take about two years. So this was no quick fix, and I don't think anyone mm. is going to be shocked by the fact that you haven't immediately been able to get an erection. Sure. What's the story with the smoking? I'm still smoking. How much are you smoking? Um, about 10 to 15 a day. Okay. Now look, you know all that good stuff I was yeah. saying about the Mediterranean diet taking two years to work? Yeah. It's not going to have the amazing impact we hope unless we address the other lifestyle factors that sure. are contributing to your erectile dysfunction. You have got to acknowledge the fact that the diet cannot be working to its full potential or have an impact on your health concerns mm. unless you address the smoking. Sure. Though changing to a Mediterranean diet is a positive move, if Terry carries on smoking, his chances of improving his PVD and getting an erection are very slim. My plan is to give up smoking. I, I want to spend the next month getting rid of another stone of weight, and then I really want to bring the two together, giving up smoking and a good diet. And the change it's made in my thoughts uh, gives me hope for a longer life and hopefully a sexier one. Well done for Terry for embracing the Mediterranean diet. It's a healthy diet. We know it improves cardiovascular health, so good for him. But unfortunately, uh, it's rearranging deck chairs on a sinking ship if he doesn't quit smoking. So he's really got to make that a priority. Eleven weeks ago, Gozen came to the food hospital for her devastating skin condition, Hydrodenitis suppurativa. Research into it is limited, so there is no tried and tested diet. Gozen's food plan was at the cutting edge of dietetic science. The intention was to make her insulin levels lower and more stable in order to reduce the inflammation. So has Geo's pioneering prescription, along with the beneficial effects of a once-in-a-lifetime holiday, had an impact on her skin. Gozen, you look very well. How's your skin been? really good. I've managed to do what I wanted to do. It's not really stopped me from doing anything. Okay. Um, and the beach really helped. Yeah, so sun can help hydrogenitis a little bit, you know, we think. So it's interesting that you think that might have dried it out a little bit. It's definitely helped the condition. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, Gazan, can we take a look at your skin? Yep. So there's still the cysts there in the pustules. This area here was oozing so much. Mm. Um, even when I put a top on, it would stick to the top. Whereas now, it's actually dry. Yeah. Before, I would just be sitting down and it would start oozing down my neck. Whereas, I don't remember the last time it's done that. Wow, it's a massive improvement. Yeah. All right, let's have a look at your back as well. That is considerably improved, I would say. It's a lot less painful. There's less cysts, basically, aren't yes. there? And, and they're drier. So here we've got pictures of your armpit before. There's a little more pus there and there was a lot more sort of darkening and inflammation of the skin there as well. So that's quite significantly better, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it is, that is an improvement. Is it yeah. upsetting to see that? it is upsetting. Yeah. It's a painful reminder for Gozen of just how shocking her symptoms were. But there has been a striking improvement in her skin over a relatively short time. So will her inflammation levels show such a dramatic change as well? So other things that we measured were your inflammatory marker, the CRP. Mm -hmm. Last time it was um, over 70. And here it's come down to 41. Wow. Yeah. That's a big improvement. It is. <laughs> it's almost halved, really. So how did you get on with the food plan? The biggest improvement for me that I found was that if I don't eat at regular times, my mood goes really low. And when my mood's really low, my body's very stressed and the, I notice like a flare or something right. like that. And I just found myself not wanting snacks like crisps, chocolates, cookies. So instead of that, I would carry around oranges, bananas and nuts. 
Right, yeah, so the diet's helped you sort of eat more regularly, mm -hmm. be less stressed. Obviously, you've been on holiday, mm -hmm. uh, and you've been to a sunny destination. So mm -hmm. I think a combination of these things has, has definitely improved your skin. Yeah. Do you think you're going to continue with any of these diet changes at all? Definitely. It's not a diet, it's a healthy eating plan. Right. And the mm -hmm. condition obviously does get a lot worse with stress, so it, I think it's definitely helped. Great. So it seems there is some help for Gozen and other people like her with this incurable disease. But now she's back to a busy working life in the British winter, her challenge to maintain these brilliant results starts now. Next time on The Food Hospital, it's all about the kids. We meet a teenager exhausted by his neurological condition. I sometimes show bang, bang, beep. A four-year-old with a catastrophic case of epilepsy. Eventually, he could have profound learning difficulties and he probably wouldn't recognise us. Oh. We investigate if party food really does send children wild and we'll also be revealing the results of our nationwide fibre challenge.